And now, Futurist looks at Arctic research. It is seal hunting day for marine biologists Kit Kovacs and Christian Leidersen. Both researchers work for the Norwegian Polar Institute. Instead of rifles and axes, they are armed with nets, syringes, scissors and plastic tags. It's minus 10 degrees Celsius. They are sailing through some of the most inhospitable waters in Europe, in the Spitsbergen Archipelago, in the heart of the Arctic Ocean, 3,000 kilometres north of Oslo. In the shadow of huge glaciers that flow into the sea, they are searching for newly born bearded seal pups. The pups are captured, measured and weighed when they are two to three days old. Scientists take samples of blood and whiskers to help them determine what the pups eat. After tagging and marking, they are released to return to their mothers. Along with feeding habits and birth rate, researchers are trying to learn how bearded seals are adapting themselves to their dramatically changing environment. Bearded seals live, reproduce and feed under a surface layer of broken ice. Ice which is becoming scarcer and scarcer in these latitudes. Normally this kind of habitat is basically limitless for the animals that live on it. There's hundreds and hundreds of square kilometers of sea shore fast ice normally. But last year we had none in this fjord, and this year we have very limited amounts of it. So we're seeing, compared to a few years ago when you had prime conditions for bearded seals, how they're managing now in this changed Arctic environment. And what they see worries them. Last year, in the absence of sea ice, bearded seals try to give birth in holes and caves along the coastline. Environmental changes are happening faster than many Arctic species can adapt to. The risks are real for all ice-associated seals. If the inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change predictions are right about the direction and trends that sea ice are supposed to follow in the coming decades, it will be an extreme challenge to all ice breeding seals and the animals that depend on them, like polar bears, and coastal native peoples in other countries that depend on ring seals and harp seals as a primary food source. Kitten Christian's research base was originally a coal mining community. Ni Alassund is now the world's most northern settlement and the European Centre for Arctic Environment Research. Work will intensify during the 2007-2008 International Polar Year. Some research projects are small, others are huge, like the 16 million euro EU-funded Damocles project, the largest ever European Arctic research project, involving 45 scientific institutions from 12 European countries. Rainer Vockenroth works for one of these institutions. A German scientist specialising in atmospheric physics, he works for the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar Research. Every day at precisely 13.15, he has to launch a meteorological balloon that helps him measure temperature, pressure, humidity and gas traces at different heights in the upper atmosphere. In the Arctic over the last 30 years, the average temperature has risen between 3 and 5 degrees Celsius, depending on the region. Elsewhere, average global temperatures, particularly in southern regions, have risen between 0.9 and 1.2 degrees Celsius. So here global warming is more obvious than in other parts of the world. This is because Arctic regions have special conditions. Light reflection is very different here. Clean white snow reflects more light than the soot-covered snow you find in industrialized regions. So here there are more reflections and the air heats up more. In southern latitudes, without sea ice, light is absorbed by the oceans. For years, German physicists and meteorologists have been taking Arctic measurements of atmosphere and UV radiation. Hello, it's Rainer from New Orleans. I would like to launch a weather balloon. Like most of his colleagues, Rainer Wockenroth, 
thinks global warming is a developing process affected by a multitude of factors. Many factors, but with one consequence. Warmer winters and hotter summers are set to challenge whole Arctic ecosystems. French marine biologists Fanny Narcy and Margot Noyon are taking a really close look at the whole process. Both will spend five months here, studying plankton. Once a week, weather permitting, they take a boat to fish for microscopic animals in the field around the scientific base. Warmer waters are attracting more and more Atlantic plankton species, which are smaller and contain fewer lipids than their Arctic cousins. It's something that could threaten the whole Arctic food chain. If the water masses change, large Arctic species will migrate north, the Atlantic species will become more abundant, and the available food here in the fjord will not be the same. Our interest is to see whether these small Atlantic plankton species will be able to provide the needs of larger species in the food chain. We want to discover where they fit, what they eat and what eats them, how they produce lipids and in what quantity. Lipids help living organisms make fat reserves, a crucial survival factor in the Arctic. Chemical analysis helps researchers measure lipid deposits in Atlantic plankton. The smaller these deposits are, the less fat Arctic fish and marine mammal species will be able to absorb and the more vulnerable the whole ecosystem will become. We're trying to find out whether Arctic fish are continuing to select local plankton, which are richer in fats and lipids, or if they're eating everything. If they're eating all the available plankton species, including Atlantic plankton, which contain fewer fats and lipids, what will be the effect? Will it decrease the fish's own reserves? Au niveau de la qualité alimentaire, de diminuer leurs réserves, leurs propres réserves. Aiskadu is a tool researchers use to understand one of the environmental factors affecting Arctic plankton. Glaciologist Jack Kohler has been studying glaciers for more than 20 years. He considers himself a glacier doctor and comes to Spitsbergen twice a year to check their health. The Spitsbergen archipelago boasts 1,000 glaciers, some just a few square kilometers, others 600 square kilometers. All of them are in poor health. By extracting ice cores, Jack calculates how much new ice accumulates on the glacier in winter and how much melts away in summer. The glacier Jack Kohler is working on this morning is retreating 100 kilometers a year, adding fresh warmer water to the Arctic Ocean. This glacier is very unhealthy. It has been retreating for, well, 90 years or so. It started in the 1920s, and uh, it's been retreating more or less steadily since, since that time. But the last 10 years or so, we have seen an increase in the rate of, of, of ice loss. The, the real important story uh, is, is the contribution of all the Svalbard glaciers to sea level rise. Sea level is rising at about three millimeters per year. Uh, that's documented with satellite measurements. And that's the global average. So even though the Arctic is very far from most people, uh, what happens here will nonetheless impact people around the world. <laughs>